Let's get started. Um, I have to call, uh, cancel my office hours today. I have to help the friend to move a refrigerator. Not looking forward to that, but there you have it. Uh, let's see, reminders over here on the left side of Blackboard. Uh, if you haven't set up your Canvas or Desmos account, right, you have to go to start here. That's where it's going to have the course code for your Desmos, okay? Um, You'll have, uh, don't forget, you have the Tomas Rivera Tutoring Center right in the center of campus, right? So if you're struggling with this stuff and it's review, you really need to work on it, get ahead of it, spend some time with the tutoring lab. Uh, they, I think they have Zoom as well. And there's also the Tutor Me Online Tutoring, the link there. I think it's 24 seven online tutoring, okay? So you'll have lots of resources, uh, take advantage of them. Now, we are in the second week, so we should be in module two, but we're a little behind, right? So we're gonna finish up module one today. We're gonna to finish 1.2, but um, again, we're gonna to try to, we have to get through module two by the end of the week. And there is this practice writing assignment in module two. So you should download that and start working on that, okay? So in addition to the web work, you have practice writing assignments, right? Where you have to actually write your, answers out in math and upload it as a single PDF file there. All right. And uh, if we have time, if we finish 1.7 early this week, then we'll work this writing assignment in class, right? But if we don't have time, right, then we won't. So start working on it now so that if you have questions about it, you can ask me in class and kind of force me to work on it in class, okay? All right, you can always ask math questions in class, right? You don't have to wait till after class to ask me a math question. Right? If you have that question, a lot of people are gonna have it too, okay? So module one, section 1.2 here. Um, this is all easy stuff. This is just domain and range today. So we're gonna take domain and range and we're just gonna smash it into the dirt, right? You're gonna cram it in your head until it's just there. All right, so here's a couple of charts. Y'all know how charts work. All right, domain is input, range is output. Domain is left and right, range is up and down. So for this chart on the left, these five movie titles is the domain, right? The range is these five numbers. Let's see, what, 290, you know, 225, 160 or whatever. So the range is five numbers. The domain is five numbers. That's it, okay? Not, it's not an interval, just those five numbers. Over here, these years, these 14 years, those are the domain. And the range is all these possible outcomes. It could be 7.1%, 6%, right? So there's, there's 14 percentages in the range. There's 14 years in the domain, right? That's it, piece of cake. Now I know like, Input and output is pretty simple concepts, but there's going to be a lot of different notation for writing this stuff down. So it's going to start to get all complicated real quick, even though it's a simple concept. Here's another visualization of a function f. So here the domain is a, b, and c. The range is x, y, and z. Now the letter d is not the domain, right? You're like a, b, c, d, right? But no, this function has only been defined to be able to handle these three things, a, b, and c. B is not in the domain, okay? And now, okay, here's some other like visual stuff here. Um, we're gonna look at just a few of them, okay? We don't need all of them. You can generalize, right? So here's the inequality, X greater than A, right? So if this is our real number line, we would put a round bracket here at A, and then we would do this, right? So that's a visualization of all the X's that are bigger than A. Notice we put a round bracket here because we're not including A, right? If we wanted to include A, we would put a square bracket, all right? So round brackets versus square brackets. Or sometimes instead of these brackets, sometimes they'll put a solid dot versus an open dot. All right, this is the same thing as the round edge, 
uh, square parentheses. So the interval notation is the same. We have from A to infinity, not including A. All right, down here we have from A to infinity, uh, including A. Now, if it's infinity, you never put a square bracket with infinity because infinity is not a number, it's a direction, right? You never get to infinity. So infinities always have these round brackets, all right? So, um, Let's see here. I guess we can get into numbers here. Let's get into some numbers. Let me throw some stuff in that's not in the book. So we have our natural numbers, right? Uh, natural numbers. They use funky in. So here's set notation, a squiggly. Some people include zero. Some people don't. One, two, three, dot, dot, dot. There's a set of all natural numbers, right? So a long, long time ago, we didn't actually have numbers per se. Right, we had a gaggle of geese and a flock of whatever, right? Depending on what type of object you were looking at and how many there were, there was a word for that, all right? So, you know, we'll call them natural numbers, but back then there were just links, basically. Like there was a certain quantity of beans or rocks or something, right? They didn't have this idea of just seven. That didn't exist. You had seven horses or seven sheep or seven of something. There's no such thing as just seven, right? Um, so that's why zero is like, some people add it, some people don't, because it took them a long time to come up with the idea of zero, okay? So those are natural numbers. Again, we use funky in for the natural numbers. Like the idea of negative numbers, you know, again, they didn't have just the numbers. They were using links usually, right? You didn't have a negative number of sheep. That was just beyond like their capacity for abstract thought, right? But eventually they figured out, oh, we can use these things for like decks, you know, like you owe these seven sheep. So we have the integers, integers, all right? We use funky Z for the integers. And all that is, is throw in the negatives with the positives of the natural numbers. And that, those are your integers, okay? But we have more numbers than that. We have the real numbers, right? So let's keep going. I'm going to say next step is let's take the ratio of any integer to any integer. They use, uh, I think, funky Q. So how do I write an integer over an integer? How would I just say that? Well, mathematically, I could say the set of all A over B such that A and B are elements of the set of integers. So that's a shortcut way of saying just give me an integer over an integer, right? That's the mathematically concise and precise way of saying that. So the rational numbers like three halves, right? That's 1.5000000 000 000 000 000 000 000 with an infinite number of zeros, right? That's a rational number. The number two is an integer. It's also a natural number. It can also be written as two over one or 2.000 with an infinite number of zeros, okay? So the rational numbers are, their decimals have a repeating pattern, all right? You might have like a whole bunch of random numbers, but then the next three repeat over and over and over again. You might have a million digits and then those million digits repeat, all right? So it's not just like one third where it's just three repeating over again. You could have seven, nine, seven, nine, seven, nine. You could have point one, two, three, four, five, six, 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 you know what I mean? Uh, so rationals, the decimals repeat, and um, so we're, but there's still more numbers. We want to get to the real numbers, right? Real numbers, all right? We use funky R for that. So what we do is we take the decimals that don't have a repeating pattern, numbers like pi, right? Pi is 3.14 something, something, something. It goes on forever, and there is no pattern. That means all the hard drives and all the computers on the earth can't store the single number pi. The single number pi requires an infinite amount of information. All right, and so that's the art of computer science. Computer science is the goal is using math to like to make a mechanical or an electrical brain that could produce like a human thought. That was the goal of computer science, but our computers have to round off. Right, it can only store so many digits, and then it has to round off. But it's doing a billion, billions of operations in a second, right? So if you do an operation and then you round it off, and then you take that result and you use it in another calculation, then you round it off, 
and then you use that in another cutting. So you've rounded off a billion times over. How are you going to get a number that's like useful for anything, right? It's just an error upon an error and an error and an error, right? So that's the art of computer science is being able to do all those calculations, rounding the whole time. Everything's an approximation of an approximation of an approximation, but your result is actually something useful. Okay, so that's the big issue with computer science, right? So you take the rationals, and why are they called rationals, and why are the other ones called irrationals? Well, think of the time when Pythagoras's day, right, from the Pythagorean theorem, and he also discovered music, like what a note is and all that. So all of our music theory comes from our first mathematician as well, right? Music and math are one and the same. Um, it's amazing how music, you know, addresses your emotions, right? How, but math doesn't, math is, math and music are one and the same. So it's really the math is programming your emotions when you listen to music. Okay, but um, Pythagoras was Greek, right? So the Greeks had al uh, geometry, the Arabs had algebra, right? So the Greeks, again, they didn't have a number, right? They didn't have numbers, but they had lengths. So they would take a stick, a straight edge, and they would say, okay, this is length one. You know, we would say feet or meters or whatever, but whatever the length of that stick is, that's one length, right? And then you could sit it down, draw a line. You could take that stick, put it at the end of the line, and you could construct a length of one, a construct a length of two, or whatever, right? So these were physical, tangible objects, these lines that we create. Well, how would you make a, a length of three halves? Well, you'd use a compass, right? Which lets you make circles, not the one that points in the directions, right? let you make a circle. So with a straight edge and a compass, you could construct different lengths and different shapes, right? So um, at the time, uh, a length existed if you could construct it, right? If you couldn't construct it, there's nothing there to contemplate, right? So they, these lengths that they could construct, right? The number associated with those lengths, there wasn't called rationals back then. It was just in numbers, right? So they, they, Pythagoras assumed that any length that you can construct has to be a ratio of a whole number to a whole number, basically an integer over an integer, okay? And um, if you take Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, if this is length one and this is length one, this has to be the square root of two, right? And obviously you can construct this very simple triangle. The square root of two happens to not be a rational number. They didn't know that. They, they approximated it with a, a fraction, with a whole number over a whole number, right? They didn't know that it, it actually, if you're gonna get it exact, that you couldn't do it, right? So basically if you aren't part of their religion, the Pythagorean religion where all is number, right? If you believe these links that could be constructed weren't, a whole number to a whole number, a ratio of whole numbers, well, then you were just irrational, right? And that's where the term irrational number came up, right? Once this guy came out and he, he pointed out to Pythagoras and all of his followers, he said, uh, by proof by contradiction, proof by contradiction kind of works like this. Take something that you know is absolutely false, then assume it's true, right? And then if that implies something else, right? whatever it implies has to be false because you started off with a false supposition, All right? So this is how a proof by contradiction works. Take something you know is false, assume it's true, and see what comes from that, All right? So this guy proved that the square root of two was irrational, All right? Which totally just destroys their religion, right? That's the fundamental basis of their religion, all is number. Well, this is an infinite sequence of digits. They didn't have decimals back then, right? All they had was these whole numbers and ratios of them. That's all they had. So the idea of the, you know, decimals back then, they didn't have that. And again, as a decimal, it's infinitely long with no pattern, right? So they couldn't even begin to think about that. But this guy showed that, yeah, this number, this length is not the ratio of a whole number to a whole number. It's impossible. So they took him out on a boat and they drowned him. Right, that's our first mathematical martyr, right? Like if you have a religion, that's one way to keep it. Anybody that shows otherwise, you just kill them or you slander them by calling them irrational, okay? So if you take rationals and irrationals, dump them in a bag together, you have your real numbers. You dump them out on the table, you can put them in order from least to greatest, and you've got a number line with zero right in the middle. And here, we're mainly gonna be focused on real numbers all semester. 
to at the end, we're going to get into imaginary and complex numbers too. So we'll have a number plane instead of just a number line. Okay. So, so when we're talking about domain and range, right, and any other ab, any other math class, you know, we're not just fixated on real numbers. And here we were going to be for domain. So we're talking about any real number you can plug into the function where you get a real number back, right? If you can plug in a real number, but it gives you back an imaginary number, we'd say, oh, that's not in the domain, right? Higher level math classes, we don't care because we work with all kinds of numbers, you know, complex, the quaternions and so on. It's like, so what? You're plugging something in, you're getting something back. But in here, we're fixated on real numbers for now, okay? So there's your, your numbers and some set notation, all right, and a little bit of history. And Pythagoras hated beans, apparently. He just hated beans, something having to do with flagellants. So when, like, the Roman army came to kill him because, like, his cult was getting too big and he was running from the Roman army, he encountered a bean field and he said, nope, I'd rather die by the hands of the Romans than run through this bean field. So that's another one of the myths and legends surrounding Pythagoras. This is a long, long, long time ago, so we don't know what actually happened, what didn't, right? But these are actually written stories about him, okay? And there still are Pythagoreans today, just like there are people that believe in Zeus and all that as an actual religion, you know? They teach it to us in like school, like, oh, it's literature. No, this was their actual religion, and people still believe that religion today, right? The religion, not just a story. All right, so... So again, believe whatever you want. I'll believe in you. I mean, some people are crazy, but you know, we all change. We all grow every day. Some people are like, people don't change. I like, guess we do. We change a little bit every day until we're dead, right? We all end up there. It's just, that's proof that we change every day, right? All right, so let's look at an ordered set here. Oh, did I forget? No, I remember. All right, here's a set of ordered pairs. So this is set notation. We have squiggly brackets. So this is a set of things, and these things are ordered pairs. It's called an ordered pair because the order matters. 3, 10 is not the same as 10, 3, right? The order matters. So we think of here, we're going to think of the first number as the input, all right? So the domain is going to be the set of 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Right, and the second number will be the range. So the range is going to be 10, 20, 30, 40. Notice the 10 shows up twice. So what? It doesn't mean we write it twice, right? The range is just all the possible outputs, right? We don't have to write it twice there. Now, um, skip some of this. Here's a simple example. Here's a function. They actually give us a function and they want to know what the domain is. Finding the domain is a lot easier than finding the range. So we're going to here x squared minus one. I could take any real number, positive or negative, and I can square it and I get a real number. And I can subtract one from that and I still have a real number, right? So I can plug in any real number I want and I'm going to get a real number back. All right. So the domain is all real numbers. This is a simple polynomial. Y'all remember your polynomials? If I have like 3x to the fifth minus 2x third plus one, that's a polynomial. As, no matter how many terms I have, as long as the powers of the x's are positive integer values, all right, that's a polynomial. And the domain is always going to be all real numbers for polynomials, right? Here's what a polynomial looks like. Here's x squared, right? Here's x cubed. Uh, x to the fourth looks something like that. Basically, the higher the power of the x, the more squiggles you get, okay? That's a polynomial. But at the ends, they always have arrows, so they go forever right and left. There's no breaks in this thing, all right? So polynomials are just that way. They're nice. We like polynomials, right? There's no break in the thing. It goes forever left and right, you know? So this thing here would be something like, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. This would have an x to the sixth in it. All right, there, there'd be some other, you know, x to the fifth, or maybe an x squared or whatever, but the highest power would be to the sixth, since there's six squiggles, right? That's how your polynomials work. Um, mm -mm. Now let's look at this one. All right, this one is another uh, function. So there's two things 
there's mainly just two things you have to look out for in here. You can't divide by zero and you can't take the square root of a negative number, right? Higher level of math, you, there's all kinds of other issues, but in here, that's basically it. So if you look at this, X cannot be two, right? You can't divide by zero. You plug in two, you're gonna get a zero on the bottom. It chokes, right? So that's what the domain isn't, right? That's the fastest way to write down. When I say X is not equal to two, I know what you mean. I know what the domain is, but I didn't tell you what it is. I told you what it's not, right? Plus in WebWorks, there is no not equal to symbol, is there, right? So we did, we'd wanna have to write this down another way. I might be like, okay, it's all real numbers except for the number two, the set with the number two in it. So this is like a subtraction symbol for set, right? But there's no funky R symbol in WebWorks either. So it's going to be one of these, right? Like everything from negative infinity up to two, not including two, and everything from two, not including two, up to infinity. So that's how you would write it with interval notation. Right. If we're going to do it with like the diagram, our little line here, see this is, here's the number two. We would need round brackets in the same spot doing that. Okay. It's any real number except for two. All right. So there's four different ways of saying the same thing. Right. I mean, how complicated can we make left and right and up and down, input and output? Right. Well, there's some little subtleties here. Right. And subtleties usually occur at the endpoints, hence these round or square brackets. And it just so happens that the interesting stuff usually happens at the end point. So we really need notation to differentiate that, right? Uh, more, oh, here's one. What was the other one? Don't divide by zero and don't take the square root of a negative number, right? I mean, I'm happy to take the square root of a negative number because I can work with complex and imaginary numbers, right? It sucks that it's called imaginary numbers. Imaginary numbers are just as real as real numbers. It's just the term real number was already taken, right? So that next level like uh, the mathematical invention is like when they first hit, because if you take something like a polynomial, like 3x to the fourth minus 2x squared plus 1 equals 0, the 3, the 2, and the 1, those are all real numbers. But if you try to solve for x, you might end up getting an imaginary number. So it's like, how is it an equation where you have coefficients that are all real, but the solutions can come out imaginary, right? When they first did try to solve stuff like that and they were getting square roots of negatives, they didn't know what to think about that. I mean, they just finally got used to negative numbers, you know, it's like, they're like, oh, what is this? They also didn't know what to do with something like that at the time, like, because uh, every they didn't have numbers. These were links usually. You know, if it's a sheep or anything else, just think of it as a link, but they still had to have this physical, tangible thing. So if you thought about like an X to the fourth, what is that? That's a link. I mean, a link is a link. A link squared would be an area. A link cubed would be a volume. Well, in a link to the fourth power be, it just didn't make any sense, right? So they didn't have, that's why we call it squared, cubed, right? We, you know, so volume and a link, right? We have X to the second power is, x squared, because it's a square, literally, right? x to the third power, right, is x cubed, because it's literally a cube, if you think about it as a link. But x to the fourth power, we don't have this other name for it, right? We just work with x to the fourth power, right? Well, now we have general relativity, so it'd be like a space-time cube, right? A four-dimensional cube. But they didn't have that, so they didn't, they just didn't mess with that stuff. It didn't have a physical ramification for them, right? But now we can do that, you know, but... You can get imaginary solutions or complex number solutions. Remember, you get those from your quadratic formula when you take the square root of plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac. Sometimes that b squared minus 4ac might be negative, and you're taking the square root of it as negative. All right. So anyhow, if you look at this, for our purposes, that can't be negative. We say 7 minus x, whatever it is in here, no matter how big the expression or ugly it is, it has to be greater than or equal to zero. I can take the square root of zero, it's zero. There's no problem there, right? So from here, I would say, okay, uh, subtract seven from both sides. And now I'll multiply both sides by minus one, which makes this inequality swap. It has to flip, all right? So you could probably look at that and just write that down, obviously, right? It's not too hard to do. Why am I showing you this? because this is a super simple example. If this is something hairy, 
you start here and you use your little math trick to isolate X and you have the answer, right? So you want to write this stuff down even for the simple ones so that you understand the process for when you get something that is too hard where you can't just write the answer down. So why do we have to flip this uh, inequality? Well, think about it. One is less than two, right? If I throw a minus to both sides, well, all right, negative two is now less than minus one, okay? So don't forget that with inequalities, if you multiply or divide by minus, that inequality has to flip, okay? So X has to be less than seven, right? Uh, if I plugged an eight in here, seven minus eight, that would be the square root of minus one, right? That wouldn't be any good. All right, so the domain here is X less than or equal to seven. Web work should be happy with that, or you could write uh, negative infinity to seven with a square bracket, right? Or you could do that. All right, so that's how you deal with square roots. Cube roots, you're fine. You can take the cube root of a negative number, you get a negative number back, right? So square roots, fourth roots, sixth roots, any even root, you can't put a minus in there because you end up with an imaginary number. A third root or a fifth root or a seventh root, any odd root, you can plug negative numbers in there. It's fine. It's going to just give you a negative number back. It doesn't go into the realm of imaginary numbers, okay? Uh, here's a good question here. Can there be functions in which the domain and range do not intersect at all? Absolutely. The domain and the range have they're two totally separate universes. All right. If you think about these up here, the domain is movie titles and the range is numbers. Over here, the domain is dates and the range is percentages. There doesn't have to be any connection between domain and range other than that your function takes one as input and the other one as an output, okay? So they don't have to have anything in common. So this example here, negative one over the square root of X is a function, right? Uh, you look at that first off, you can't divide by zero, so X can't be zero, right? And then you're also like, oh, it's a square root, so what's inside of there has to be either bigger than or equal to zero, but we already said X can't be zero, so let's get rid of that. So here's our domain. X can be any positive number, okay? That's our domain. What's our range? The range is harder to visualize. Whenever you're doing your web work, homework, get you some graphing software, graph every function you see, all right? So that you get that visualization intuition, all right? We'll talk about software here in a second. So range is a little more difficult. It's like, okay, well, if I have a positive number and I square root it, I get a positive number. One divided by a positive number is a positive number, but then I'm putting a minus in front of it. So a minus in front of a positive is gonna be a negative. So the range is going to be all negative numbers. So you can see here the domain is the complete opposite of a range. The domain is any positive number. What you're gonna get back is a minus sign in front of any positive number. So you're gonna get back all the negative numbers. So they don't intersect at all. There's no reason to think they should. They're completely separate universes, right? You play, you built a machine. The input has nothing to do with the output. The machine creates the output, right? Okay. All right, even, let's see. So this is the same stuff as before. I'll go ahead and we'll look at some of those. They're just saying you can do open bubbles or closed bubbles, but now they're going to throw in some set notation. I already gave you some set notation right here. These are squiggly brackets here. So they're saying H, they use H now for some reason. It's between five and 10, but not including five, but do include 10. So that's the same as saying H is five is less than H, which is less than or equal to 10. Right? They're writing here, they're saying the set of all H such that five is less than H is less than or equal to 10. All right, so earlier I put this for such that, all right? They're saying all H, they use that symbol. Different books are gonna use different symbols, all right? So they're saying just the set of all H such that this is true. All right, so there's their uh, set builder. They call it set builder notation. I just call it set notation. Interval notation, this is from five, no, it's wrong. From five 
to 10, right? Five to 10, not including five, but include 10. All right, and just generalize that to the rest of these examples. All righty, let's see, here's one. Uh, so again, simple ideas, lots of different notation for the same stuff. This is the set of all X such that the absolute value of X is greater than or equal to three. That's how you would read that, okay? So this, I, this really should be longer than me, right? There is a button on the keyboard that has like this guy and it's longer than this guy, all right? So if the absolute value of X is gonna be bigger than or equal to three, then X has to either be less than minus three or greater than positive three, including minus three and positive three, okay? So this set here is the same as this interval here. Again, this is union, it's like plus sign for intervals, okay? Like multiplication, we have like a hundred different symbols for multiplication because you can do different kinds of multiplication. Right? And it depends on what you're multiplying. Are you multiplying numbers or functions or matrices or what kind of mathematical objects you are multiplying? You might have three or four different types of multiplication, right? You might multiply two vectors to get a vector, or multiply two vectors to get a matrix, or multiply two matrices to get a number, right? It depends on how you define your multiplication, okay? Uh, kind of like absolute value is the distance from zero, right? It's like a length. Well, you know, it's like if you're looking at a vector, which is an arrow instead of a number or a, a, a coordinate, an X, Y coordinate, you could think of it as an arrow. Instead of calling it the absolute value, we would call it its modulus, which is just the length of the arrow. So the same thing as the distance from the origin, right? So, they, so just for absolute value, we have lots of different terms for the same thing depending on the context here. Um, let's see. Uh, here's a good picture. Analyze this. It should be too hard. I ran out of time. All right, here's a domain is left and right, right? So if we, how far to the left we go, it's minus five. So our domain starts off at minus five. This is, filled in, so we want to include minus five. How far to the right does it go? Well, they're implying right here that you have a vertical isotope, okay? They're implying that. So what that means is that this line, the further down you go, the closer we're getting to the number five. The further down you go, you get closer and closer to five, but you never reach five, right? It's saying you can't plug five into this function. It'll choke, right? So it'll go up to five, but not including five. So there's your domain, all right? Now, if this wasn't here, this is kind of ambiguous. If that wasn't there, I would look at this and think this would be to infinity, right? The further down you go, the further right you go, right? You just keep going down, you keep going further right, right? So that's why when you draw stuff, if there's a vertical isotope, you have to put that in there. That means that there is nothing over here, right? Without this, I would let this just be like, if I keep going down, I can go to 10, 20, I can get as far right as I want, right? Okay, so that's why, you know, diagrams are important. We have to have these dotted lines, vertical isotopes. So let's look at the range, all right? How far down do we go? Well, this arrow says the range goes all the way down to negative infinity. How high does it go? It goes all the way up to five here. And since this is filled in, we have to include it, all right? Domain, left and right, range up and down. Domain, input, range, output. Simple, right? And how many different ways can we write that down? Okay. So uh, da, 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 da. that's the same kind of example. That one looks boring. World population increase. Let's look at that one. All right, so it looks like the domain starts off, the domain starts off at 
1950. Try that again. 1950, and it goes all the way over to 2000, and we will include the endpoints. The range, let's see, the lowest looks like maybe 43, and then the highest value here looks like 90. So there's your range, right? And this is a continuous line, so it, it includes every number between these two numbers, not just some numbers, right? Like up here, like this is not a continuous line, right? So the domain isn't, you don't have 2,000.79. That's not in the domain. You have 2,000, you have 2,001, right? This is what we'd call as discrete, whereas this is continuous. Oh, the thing about, uh, I forgot to mention, the natural numbers, there's an infinite number of them, right? One, two, three, four, there's an infinite number of them, right? The real numbers, there's an infinite number of them too, but there's infinitely more of these than there are of those. If you look at how many numbers are there between zero and one, like real numbers, right? Well, there's an infinite number of decimals, right? So let's just look at the number one. What's the next real number after the number one? 1.00001, right? Well, what about 1.00001, right? You could pick any real number you want, as close to the number one as you wanted, but there'd still be an infinite number of numbers between your number and the number one. There is no such thing as the next number in the real number land, right? So although there is, this is infinite, the real numbers are what we call uncountably infinite. So natural numbers, countably infinite, real numbers, uncountably infinite, all right? So, I mean, even all we're just doing is talking about numbers here, but these concepts of infinity start getting in there and you get into meta-analysis, meta-mathematics, and that's some neat stuff. That's where you get into Godel's completeness theorem and incompleteness theorem, things like that. And there's like truths that can't be proven to be true in limited uh, mathematical structures like arithmetic and things like that. Okay. Although there are some things that are true, we can't prove they're true depending on what kind of a uh, mathematical world you're working in, okay? So this whole issue of like, pick a, a real number, what's the next number, right? They have an axiom of truth in mathematics. They came up with, well, just pick a number. Don't tell me what it is. Let's just assume that there is a next number and then they prove all kinds of cool mathematics with that that's useful in the real world and application. But there's a whole other side of mathematics and mathematicians that say, you can't just assume there is a next number. So it's an axiom, an axiom of truth. So there's two like there's divided by groups of mathematicians, some that accept the axiom of truth and some that don't. The ones that do accept it is because with that, you can create all kinds of cool mathematics that has applications in the real world that's useful. So obviously we should do that, right? The other ones are more pure. They're like, no, you can't do that, right? You're in a realm of uh, philosophical destruction. Okay, so here's our toolkit function, f of x equals c. Give me any input, the output is the same number c. The domain is any real number, it goes forever right and left. The range is just the number c, it's the only thing you can get out of it, right? This thing doesn't go up or down at all, the range is just c. That's the simplest function. The next simplest function is the input is the same as the output, f of x equals x you get this diagonal line. It goes forever right and left, domains all real numbers. It goes forever up and down, the range is all real numbers, okay? Here's your absolute value. It looks just like the other one, except over here, instead of going down, you go up because the absolute value is always positive, right? So it still goes forever left and right, the domain is all real numbers. The range, however, it starts here at zero and goes up, so the range is anything greater than or equal to zero, okay? Here's your x squared. It goes forever left and right. There's no vertical asymptotes here, right? The further I go up, the further to the right I've gone. Okay, so the domain, again, is all real number, forever left and right. The range starts at zero and goes up to infinity. Here's x cubed, right? Domain, all real numbers. It goes forever left and right. x cubed is a polynomial, right? Remember, any polynomial. The domain is all real numbers. The range goes forever up and down, so it's all real numbers. Here is one over x, all right? It goes forever left and right. 
So the domain is all real numbers except for zero. Notice there's a vertical isomptote right in the middle, right? So you can't plug zero in. Try to plug zero in, where do you go? The line doesn't cross there. So the domain is anything but zero. What's the range? Well, it goes down to negative infinity. It goes up to positive infinity. But again, there's a horizontal isomptote. So you're never going to get a zero out of this function. You can never plug a zero in, and you can never get a zero back. So it just so happens that this thing, the domain and the range, happen to be exactly the same. It didn't have to be. It's coincidence. It has to do with the symmetry here. If you took this vertical line, this diagonal line, and you could flip this over the diagonal, and you would get the other side. So it has to do with the symmetries there. Here is 1 over x squared. It goes forever left and right. So the domain is all real numbers except for 0. Right? There's this hole right in the middle. You can't plug in a 0. Right? So this graph does not cross this line here. So uh, the range, it starts close to 0 and goes up to infinity. So the range is anything greater than 0. There is a horizontal isomptote here. Right? These lines never touch the x-axis. Here's a square root of x. All right, so the domain, you can't take the square root of a negative number. So there is nothing over here on the left-hand side, right? So the domain starts at 0 and goes forever to the right, positive infinity. The range does the same thing. It starts at 0, and then it goes up to positive infinity. So this one, the domain and the range happen to be the same, right? 0 infinity, including 0. Here's your uh, cube root of x, right? The cube root, uh, it goes forever left and right domains, great, all real numbers. You can take the cube root of a negative number, right? The cube root of a negative number is just a negative number, right? It's okay to take cube roots and fifth roots and seventh roots of negative numbers. They just give you negative numbers back. It's the square root or fourth root or sixth root. You can't take positive or, I mean, uh, even valued roots of negative numbers, because then you get imaginary numbers. So cube root here is fine. It goes forever left and right, and it also goes forever up and down. So the domain and the range here are both all real numbers. And let's see. Do, 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 do. All the same. So piecewise defined functions. So if you know what functions are, piecewise defined functions are real simple. All right, so let's look at this guy. So right here at 10, it looks like we have one kind of line over here before 10, and then after 10, it's something else, right? So we might want to, they use n, okay? So we want to say it's something for when n is less than or equal to 10, and it's something else when n is greater than 10, all right? This is a straight line, so let's see. It's a straight line, so it should be like something like, and they use n, mn plus b, right? So it starts here, so I know my b value would be 0. And the slope, let's see, my rise is 50, my run is 10. 5 over 10 is just 5. So this line right here is just 5n. That's what it is. The slope is 5. It goes to the origin. So if n is less than 10, oh, wait, I don't want to go up here. No, I want it to stop right here. And then for n greater than 10, uh, it's just 50. It's always just 50 over here. Boom, piecewise defined function. I define this piece, and then I define this piece. So over here, are your different domains. Here's your different, uh, basically, ranges. Does that make sense? All right, so that's a piecewise defined function. And you could do that. You could break it into as many pieces as you want, right? Like this one has three different pieces. That's fine. That's look at it a little bit. And the, the, the subtlety you have to deal with here is the endpoints. Okay. So up here, these dudes touch, right? What if they this was up here instead? Right? Well, one of these would have to be solid and one would have to be open. Otherwise, you'd have a hole. I mean, you could have a hole if this was open, but 10 would not be in the domain if both of these were open. Because you plug in a 10, you wouldn't get anything back. So there's subtleties here. This one, uh, Let's look at this. So they say f of x is x squared. x squared looks like this, kind of. Looks like that, right? Boom. But they say, no, it's only that for x less than 1. So OK, here's 1. So let me, uh, uh, there. OK, 
Yeah, maybe I should make these green. <laughs> yeah. So there we go. It's x squared for less than one, but it says less than or equal to one. So I better fill this in solid. Now they say over here between one and two, I want the function to be equal to three. So here's one, two, three. So between one and two, I need to be up here. And I have to leave this open because this does not say equal to here, right? It just says for x bigger than one. It doesn't say for equal to one, so that has to be open. But then over here at two, they say make it equal to three if x is equal to two. So over here where it's two, I need to have a solid dot here. And then now what about greater than two? Over here they say if it's bigger than two, let f of x equals x. Well, f of x equals x looks like this. It's just that diagonal line. So this thing is just to be like that. So that's what our graph would look like. We just broke it into three pieces. You just have to pay attention to the endpoints where this says equal to or it's just greater than. Okay. That's how you know whether to leave it open or close it in. Okay. That's the, the hard part is the endpoints. Okay. Uh, and that's it for 1.2. Uh, so next time we will start our module two and start on 1.7. Again, start your practice writing assignment, get your Desmos account set up, work on your web work, stay ahead on your web work, right? You can always start your web works early. Nothing wrong with that, okay? Again, I have to cancel my office hours today because I have to move a refrigerator. All right, but if you have questions, you can see me. Uh, uh, right now, and I will answer them.